Kaleo, and that's that word that in the Greek that means called, and uh, it's called to do something that you weren't previously doing, and uh, we've looked at, uh, this is week three of our four week, next week we're going to wrap it up next week, our four week series, and it's been a quick one, but we're emphasizing what the Bible has told us uh, Jesus was thought was important, and what we are called. In fact, our launch out point is, is this verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse number 21, where Peter says, To this you were kaleo, called, there's the word, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. And I think that's this is so important. Uh, Now, I guess I should preface this, and I've I've done this before, but Peter, when he starts talking about this, he's not just randomly saying this, just called, called, called. What are you saying? There's Christians in the first century who uh, it wasn't popular to be a Christian. Now, I know this is one of those things that we have a disconnect from. Because in our time period, we're like, yeah, it's not popular to be a Christian today. That's not true. In fact, what you're going to find, if you Google famous people, what you're going to find is all these different famous people, they keep coming out going, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. we got politicians that say it, we got uh, singers that say it, that uh, they're out singing about their body parts and their boyfriend and cheating on their husbands and wives and everybody else, and yet they're saying, I'm a Christian. we got people that are out doing drugs and alcohol and all those things saying, yeah, I'm a Christian. And so what I find is it's easy to say you're a Christian in the 21st century. Now, not everybody likes that. I I get that. And we are in a post-Christian country, a post-Christian nation, at least philosophically. But let me just say this. It's nothing like it was in Peter's time period or Jesus' time period. Being a Christian was going to involve suffering. And that's the point that Peter's making here. He says, to this you're called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. And then he gives us the point, and I love this point, that you should, you should, you probably won't. You're called to do something different. He says, you should follow in his steps. Follow in his steps, the steps of Christ, the steps that led him to the cross, the steps that led him to be, as we saw in, first, uh, in the first week, to care for other people, to be compassionate. Splagnizomai, right? That was that fancy Greek word we talked about in week one. That long word that said, hey, Jesus had compassion, and his compassion led to action. And in week two, last week, we talked about the fact that you're called to generosity. And Jesus, uh, he, he expects us, because he talked about finances more than he talked about anything. He talked about material wealth more than he talked about any other subject, because he knew that was something that was going to vie for our hearts. Remember he said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And that's when Jesus was really trying to get us to understand, not that he wants our money or needs it, because he doesn't. He wants us to be generous so that we'll be following in his footsteps. Because there's nothing more generous, Jesus said, than to lay down your life. And that's what Jesus did, isn't it? 
And this week we're going to talk about the third aspect, called to serve. And, and what we realize is the most significant, the most significant opportunities of your life. And, and, and you probably thought it was maybe a promotion at work. Maybe you thought it was to have wealth. Maybe it's your retirement account. Maybe you thought it was family, children, grandchildren. And those are all great things. None of those things are bad things necessarily. I'm not saying that. But you realize the most significant opportunities of your life, they don't lie in your ability to make money. They don't lie in your ability to have kids, to have what the world says is a great job. It lies in your ability to serve the cause of Christ. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. And we get to Mark chapter 10 is where we're going to be today. And we go in Mark chapter 10 and we find Jesus, in fact, there's this transition. I was talking about this in Sunday school because it fits right in where we're at in our Sunday school lessons. In Mark chapter 8, 9, and 10, Jesus is in a great transition period uh, where he's moving away from the big crowds and the big healings and the big miracles. Now, he still does a few here and there, but he's moving because he's changed his mindset. And in Mark chapter 8, 9, and 10, he, he's, he's really dealing with training the disciples for what's going to happen when he departs. He's emphasizing discipleship. And he teaches them lessons, and he tells them, in each one of these chapters, he tells them about the fact of his passion, that he's going to go and, and be betrayed, and he's going to be taken and given over to the Gentiles or the Romans and crucified. And the, the next thing you know, he's going to be killed and, and raised again on the third day. And what that is going to be towards us in our lives is make us disciples who need to follow him. Not Christian in name, but practicing disciples. True, devoted followers of Christ. And Jesus, in all three of these, he teaches these lessons on discipleship, and he has to almost repeat the same things because they don't get it through. But I think when you get to, John, uh, to Mark chapter 10, and this end of Mark chapter 10, or the middle towards the end of, of Mark chapter 10, Jesus gives us this, this lesson in discipleship that is so great because it's going to tell us exactly what he does. And there's so many things, because when we look at this, in his instructions about greatness, and Jesus does, it's, it's amazing, Jesus teaches about greatness. In his instructions about greatness, he reaches this climax in Mark chapter 10, verse number 45, which is the key verse of all of Mark. This is it. If you want to understand the gospel of Mark, what he wrote, Chapter 10, verse 45 is it. Jesus said this, and this is the climax of the passage we're going to look at today. He says, for even, for even, for even, he wouldn't really have to, but he's including himself. For even the Son of Man, greatest title he could ever use. It showed both his deity and his humanity. For even the Son of Man did not come to be, say it, what is it? He didn't come to be served. He's God, though, shouldn't he? I mean, that's what we teach all the time. We should serve God, serve God. So why wouldn't he come to be served? Because he knew it was an important lesson to teach us greatness doesn't come in serving, but being a servant. That's what he's teaching. He says, for even the Son of Man, if there's anybody that has a right to be served, it would be him, but he didn't come to be served, so why do you expect to be served? That's what he's saying to Christians. He says, but he didn't come to serve, but to serve, and not just to serve, to give. There's that generosity aspect again. See, they're interconnected. To serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that's where we look at it. And in this, this nutshell statement here, Jesus gives us the whole reason he came, and really he gives us the heart of the gospel. The truth of how important the gospel is to us. And, and in this passage here, he really gives us a question to consider. A question uh, that maybe, as Christians, maybe we've never considered before. It's not a, it's not a normal question. I, I sometimes ask you the obvious questions. But the question that Jesus is going to ask uh, indirectly through this story, and really through chapters 8, 9, and 10, but specifically to us today, and if you're not a Christian here today, or you're watching online, you're not a Christ follower, you're off the hook. You just sit back and laugh at us as Christians. But as Christians, when we accepted Jesus Christ, we are expected to follow this. And the question that, that he asks and then he's going to answer for us in this passage today is, what will the gospel make of us? I probably never thought of that question before. It's a weird question, isn't it? 
What will the gospel make of us? See, as we accepted Jesus Christ, most of us, I would say, dare say, grew up in a sort of semi-religious atmosphere. Maybe you weren't saved early on, but maybe you grew up in a pretty moral area. This area tends to be that. We're in the Bible Belt. As I tell my mother-in-law all the time, she laughs when I say this, we're in the belt buckle of the Bible Belt here. There's churches in every corner. There's more churches in, in, than there are anything around here. And that's great, but it also means that we're very religious, and that's an obstacle to Christianity, too. But the question is, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the day you got saved, you should have contemplated, and nobody really discusses this with you because they tell you to pray a prayer and they push you forward for a decision, but they don't tell you what the gospel is going to make of you. Because that's, if we, if maybe if we knew that, we wouldn't have accepted Jesus Christ's offer so quickly. I'm just being honest. Because in week one, what we learned the gospel will make of us, it'll make us more compassionate especially the people who don't, we don't like, the Samaritan and the Jew, right? And in week two, <laughs> the gospel makes us a lot more generous. And I'm not talking about just money, but generous with our time, with everything, which leads us to this week. What does the gospel do? It humbles us, and it makes us lowly servants, just like our Savior. And that's what really is, is there. But before we actually accept the call to being a servant, the call to serve, I think we better take a little bit of time to consider what being a servant is. And so today I want to give you four things found in this passage today as we go through Mark chapter 10. And we're going to start in verse number 32. We're going to consider thing, four things about being a servant that will help us understand at least how Jesus sees it in the gospel. So the question, what will the gospel make of us? Hopefully it will make us a servant by the time we're done. Because most of us, we don't like to do that. It's very opposite of our own nature. And that's the truth. So number one, we need to consider the cost of being a servant. Consider the cost of being a servant. And we pick up the story here in, in verse number 32. Jesus here, it says here, they were on their way. Now, they is Jesus, his 12 disciples, and a few other people. The big crowds have sort of departed. Jesus is now focusing his attention on his mission here. But it says they're on their way up to Jerusalem. Now, geographically, Jerusalem is built on a mountain. So most of the time you are going up geographically, but always, no matter where you're at, they were always referenced in the Bible that you're going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the location where the temple of God is, and that's where he chose to put his name, and so spiritually you're always going up to Jerusalem. So that's not, that's not uncommon, but what you may miss in your just very brief reading of this thinking, well, Jesus goes to a lot of places. He was in Samaria, he was in, you know, he was in Judea, he was in Galilee, he was in, you name it, he was there. Mark here, when he says this, they were on their way up to Jerusalem, that is more than just he's going to Jerusalem again. It is he's going to Jerusalem for the end. Mark is pointing out Jesus is on his final path to the Passion Week. He is going to face the cross he is going there for a different purpose. And so everything in, the, in, in Mark's gospel account is changing here on this one verse, turning here. And so this is a transition uh, statement here. It says, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And isn't that great? I mean, you want some encouragement in life? Jesus should always be leading the way. We talked about that in our Sunday school class today, the difference between being a follower and being a leader. Most of us, our problem in humanity is we want to always lead. We like the roles. We like to be on stage. We like the... We like to, to be in charge. And Jesus says, no, no, no. That's not how it should be in my kingdom. And so the disciples, at least they have that right. Jesus is leading the way. But notice what happens here. It says, and the disciples were astonished. Oh, astonished. Now, I, I, as I read through this, I thought, well, this is sort of weird. They've been to Jerusalem before. What's so astonishing? In fact, it keeps going. It says, the disciples were astonished while those who, were with, uh, who followed were afraid. Two words there, astonished and afraid. And, and when you look at those two words, you've got to ask, like, what in the world's going on here? What, what is, what's the problem here? You see, astonished <laughs> means amazed. They were uh, uh, unnerved. They were um, in awe of what's going on here. And it's because Jesus, for the last two chapters, has been very, very honest with him. In fact, we looked at it in Sunday school this morning. He's very honest. I'm going up to Jerusalem this time to die. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over to the religious people. The religious people don't like me. They're going to beat me. They're going to give me to the, the, the Romans, the Gentiles. And it's those Gentiles that are going to take me, and they're going to kill me. But three days later, 
it's okay. Three days later, I'm going to rise again. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but if, if you had somebody that was telling you those things, you might think, like, this guy's crazy. He might unnerve you a little bit. You might be uh, a little bit on the anxious side or astonished. They didn't know what to make of this, is what, what really that word's saying. And the other group, the people that were sort of the fringe people, they were afraid. And when I see that word of fear, I was thinking, like, what are they afraid of? What are they afraid of? They didn't really, a lot of those people, they were the fringe people. They didn't get it. And I, I, I've been told that the number one fear, the number one phobia that most people have, and I don't know if you have it, and I don't have this one, um, is public speaking. Anybody have that fear? Okay, you want to give, it, give us a speech about it? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I don't believe that's the greatest fear, though, be honest with you. Because when I came to this point, I thought, when they're afraid, here's what they're afraid of. Because the word afraid in the Greek is the word phobia. And, and I thought, what are they afraid of or who are they afraid of? And really, the, the, the idea isn't that they're afraid that somebody's going to make them do a public speaking. It's not even snakes, because I'm scared of those. I'll give you that. It's not spiders or bugs or, you know. I think the number one fear people have, and I think everyone in this room has it, fear of the unknown. <laughs> it is. That grips us like nothing else. Fear of what we don't know, because what we don't know is what we don't know. I know that's deep, but man, it scares me. And that's what we find. These people are like, he's talking about stuff I don't get, and I don't know. And it's making me unnerved. It's making me afraid here. They followed him. They're following him. He's leading, but I'm not sure about this whole thing. Now, think about the time period. In John, John chapter 11, we have Lazarus. Lazarus dies. He was a good friend of Jesus. He lived in a little town outside of Jerusalem, not far and you remember Jesus had let him die and, and be dead for four days before they arrived? And remember, there's this guy named Thomas. Thomas is very cynical. I, I, he amuses me a little bit. I, I'd like to know Thomas a little bit better. He's, I know, he gets the bad, the bad name of doubting Thomas. But Thomas, during this whole John 11 thing, at the very beginning when they're going to Jerusalem, everybody's like, I don't know if we should do this because the, the, ba- the, the religious people are out for you. Thomas says, hey, let's all go to Jerusalem so we can all die together. Isn't that the kind of guy you want with you, right? Thomas, he's a realist. And so you can see there's a little bit of unsettling. They all knew the religious people are after Jesus. And so what does Jesus do? It says, again, not for the first time, this is again, again, he, that is Jesus, took the 12, his 12 most intimate people, the people he's going to rely on to carry on his mission once he's ascended back into heaven. He says, uh, he took them aside and he told them what was going to happen. Isn't that great? Jesus can always tell you what's going to happen. You don't have to know. Jesus needs to know, though. And that should be a comfort to us. In verse 33, it says, this is Jesus' words, we are going to Jerusalem. No doubt about it. We're not going to miss it. We're going to Jerusalem, he said. And, and here's the bad news, and Jesus is so clear. In fact, this is the clearest picture, prophecy, that Jesus gives about what's going to happen to him. He says, and the Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priests and the teachers, just so you know, I'm naming them, the te- uh, teachers of the law. They will condemn him. That's a, that's a Greek word. It's a legal word. They're, gonna really, they're not going to just like, do so. They're going after him all the way. They're going to go and, and try and persecute him to the fullest extent of the law. That's what that carries. They'll condemn him to death, and we'll hand him over to the Gentiles, which is shocking enough because they didn't like the Romans. He goes on in the next verse and says, who, the Gentiles, these Romans, who... They're going to mock him and spit on him. They'll flog him and kill him. And three days later, he'll rise. Now, we're talking about this, this what we should consider. And the, the cost of being a servant is what we're trying to con, uh, consider here. And as we get through this short passage here in verses 32 through 34, what we see is Jesus warning us about what it's going to cost to serve him. And I think that's a problem because When we get into this, the first thing we see about these followers of Jesus is their lack of an understanding, or what I would say, the road to service often is is filled with misunderstanding. It is. There's a lot of people out there that misunderstand what Jesus wants for them. And as we talked about in our Sunday school class, we often, as Jim Collins would say in his book, we often take the good and put the good in front of the great. And Jesus is trying to get us to understand, hey, stop going after things that are good when you could have my life that I'm giving you, the life of being a servant, which is great. But we miss it because just like Peter, sometimes we one minute are saying, Jesus, you're the Messiah. And the next minute we're saying, Jesus, 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 no, let's not do that. And Jesus is saying, hey, get behind me, Satan. 
<laughs> that's, that's what we should learn there. And, and this road of misunderstanding, sometimes it's because we're astonished, we're in awe, we're not sure of what's going to happen. Sometimes it's because we're scared of the unknown. And that's what we see there. And then we, we also realize, though, Jesus here in these last couple of verses, he points out that the road to being a servant is not just about misunderstanding. Sometimes it involves a mission. And Jesus, hey, he's put his, as, as the writer, uh, as, as Isaiah in the Old Testament said, he, he set his face sternly like flint on his mission. That's the description of how the Savior would enter into Jerusalem. And he's full of purpose now. There's no distractions going to happen. He knows. He knows he's got a plan. He knows what he's been called to. And it's not all fun and games because he knows he's going to be called to suffer. And that's the heart of being a servant. And it's, it is a cost. Jesus wants us to understand that. His mission is clearly laid out. Jesus, Jesus, do you realize he's saying things that are crazy? He's saying, hey, this guy and this guy, are the, 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 high pri- the chief priest, the people who are in charge of the law, they're going to turn me over to the, the Romans. They're going to condemn me. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to flog me. They're going to kill me. And <laughs> I'm going to rise again three days later. It's pretty confident. He understood what his purpose was. John does that over in John chapter 13. He, he says this as they're entering into that upper room uh, discussion on the night that uh, Jesus is going to have his last supper with his disciples. John says, hey, Jesus knowing, knowing, and he talks about what he knew. He knew that it was time. And he knew that his father had given him all power. He knew all these things. And what confidence Jesus had. You know why? Because he was a servant who understood his mission. And I think one of the problems that is a cost for us as servants of Jesus Christ, in order to serve, you have to understand your mission. And now you know what I find? The church today fails to understand their mission. That's why we don't serve. We've distracted ourselves by all kinds of other things. Hey, we've got good things going on. We've got all kinds of programs. But you know what? Jesus didn't cost to do programs, did he now? Come on. He called us to take the gospel. As we read in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 in our Sunday school class, he called us to be witnesses. The same word is translated martyrs. He called us to take it to places we don't want to go, to people we don't know, not to sit comfortable in our homes and work our jobs. God never called you to work your job. He called you to take his gospel somewhere. And that's the tough thing, because it's going to cost you to be a servant. It really will. The second thing we need to consider is not just the cost, but consider the challenge. The challenge of being a disciple of Christ. The challenge of being the servant. We pick up in verse 35. It says, then James and John, and this is where the story gets good. James and John, uh, the sons of Zebedee. Now, these two guys are brothers. John happens to be the youngest of all the disciples. I don't know uh, how much older James is than John, but he had to be a little older than that. These are two prominent people. John proclaims himself to be the best friend of Jesus, the disciple who Jesus loved. He says that over and over again. He almost gets sick of it. But John, John is that guy. He, you can tell he's young. He's got that ego. James, on the other hand, not much more mature, and both of them had a little bit of a flamey personality. In fact, at one point in, in their working with Jesus, they wanted to call down fire on the people of Samaria because they didn't like the way they treated Jesus. So they have a little bit of temper. In fact, they got the nickname the Sons of Thunder because of that. It says, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came to him, that is Jesus, and this, listen to what they say, because I found this to be funny, um, both as a parent and as a, a former teacher, because I, I, I feel like this is a kid's statement here. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. <laughs> Anybody in here think they, they would be okay with their kid coming to you and I, I, I just, as teacher or whatever, maybe they haven't worded that, but I've had kids come to me, I've had my own kids do that. Hey, do what I want. Before I tell you what I want, okay, yeah, I'm never going to do that. And so when I read this, I almost, there's times I think Jesus, like, I don't know if he rolled his eyes thinking, these guys, these guys are full of themselves, aren't they? Just had that little curl up on the corners of his mouth, like, okay, here comes dumb. It's coming right at us. Here comes dumb. It's coming right at us. And and you can tell it's going to be a selfish thing, right? Because it's what we want you to do for us, not for somebody else. It's not, hey, I want you to do something nice for Donnie. No, it's God, I want this for me, and I'll tell you what it is in a minute. Now, why wouldn't you lead with that? You wouldn't lead with what you want because you know it's a dumb thing. They knew. I mean, James and John knew that because they, they planned this whole thing out. So they come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, do for us whatever we ask, <laughs> 
And I think Jesus is, you know, smiling because he's thinking this is dumb, but he's also smiling because this is going to lead into a great opportunity for me to teach you some things here. So Jesus, what does he do? He answers. Verse 36, he says, what do you want from me to do for you? What do you want? I'm not going to say yes. Notice he didn't say, he didn't give an affirmative reply. And by the way, I think sometimes as Christians, when we pray, we have that mode where we start, Jesus, I need this, 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 and we make this genie wish list for him. <laughs> and I think he's probably got that same smile going on like, uh, okay, they, they need to go back and read Mark chapter 10 because I don't do what you want for you. I do what's good for the gospel message. I do what's good for God. And it always works good for you. And that's what he asked him. What do you want? What do you want for me to do for you? In verse 37, they unhatched their plot. They replied, and, and, and you know it doesn't tell us that John or James said it. It says they said it. So they, you know they've rehearsed this, right? You ever had your kids rehearse something that was dumb? And they, you know it's been rehearsed and rehearsed, and they come to you, and you're like, no. This is, I, this is the setting. I get it. They replied, let one of us sit on your right hand and one on at your left in your glory. Now, out of that statement there, there's only one part that they got right. Jesus is going to be in glory. At least they knew that. At least they understood that Jesus is God and he will be exalted and he will be in glory. Everything else was garbage. Jesus didn't laugh at them. He's going to help them learn because that's what he's compassionate God. He's got much more patience than I have. So verse 38, he says, you don't know. And I think there's that big sigh. Everybody do that with me. You don't know what you're asking you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you? And he's going to ask two crazy things here that we probably wouldn't get right off the bat, but they understood. He says, can you drink the cup? What? Can you drink the cup? Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? And those two illustrations there went a lot further with them than we do with us because right away we're probably thinking Lord's Supper cup or something like that. And you know what, he's, he's, he's referencing that. You've got to remember, these are Jewish young men who grew up understanding the word of God, that they studied all these prophets, and they studied the law. And you know what, if you go through the Old Testament, the cup is always associated with judgment. The anger, the wrath of God would be poured out from a cup, the cup of God's wrath. In fact, even John, as he writes the Revelation, he talks about these, these different symbols, and some of the symbols give us the idea of a cup, the cup of God's wrath being poured out by these angels. Bowls, right? And so he, he says, hey, can you drink the cup of God's wrath? And he's referring to the wrath that he faces as he faces the sins of all the world put on him and the wrath of the Father because we are justified through Jesus Christ and his death. And he gives a foresight and he says, can you really deal with that? I don't think you can. And, and it's pretty obvious he's saying that. Or, and he uses the term baptism, and we always associate baptism with the baptism we do, but you realize baptism happened well before Christianity came and claimed it. Baptism happened in Judaism. That was one of the symbols for, for someone to become a proselyte into Judaism. You had to, one of the things you had to do is you had to be baptized. In fact, John the Baptist, when he's out of the Jordan River baptizing before Jesus came on the scene, really, and he ends up baptizing Jesus, that wasn't so strange. It wasn't his baptism, the fact that he's baptizing. What was strange is the fact that he's saying, repent, for the kingdom of God's at hand. Repent. That was his message was strange. Not what he was doing. They were used to that. They lined up. Even the Pharisees came out to do that. That wasn't a problem because baptism was always a symbol of me dying to something, right? Even today, our baptism we take, we baptize somebody as they accept Jesus Christ as a Savior. Baptism is a picture of your dying to your old self and being raised to walk in Jesus' new life that he gave you. That's the idea here. So it's a picture of death. And he says, hey, are you really ready to face death, the death that I'm going to face? Because I'm going to take it all on me. I'm going to take the wrath. I'm going to take the baptism of death. And, and are you really ready to face those things? And, and they've rehearsed this too, because I, I don't know if they knew Jesus was going to say something derogatory, but they, they do, because the next verse, verse 39, they jump in right away. Not even, not even any kind of different argument. They say, we can. Yep, yep. I'll pay that price. And right away, we're, if you've been around Christianity for any long time, you're like, no, they can't. There's no possible way. You know they can't. They can, they answered, and he goes on to say in verse 39, Jesus said to them, <laughs> you will. Ooh. That sounded ominous, didn't it? You will. 
You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I baptize. Now, he's not saying that they're going to have to pay the price of sins. No, no, no. What he's saying is, you know what? John, James, welcome to the world of pain and suffering. You want to be a follower, a disciple of me? It's not about sitting on seats of glory. It's about going through and suffering like your Savior, a servant. And this is where this whole decision comes through, this challenge. See, he goes on in verse 40, and he, he finishes this, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And I think that's an amazing statement. John, James, you think of a lot of yourselves. If you go back to chapter 9 in Mark, and I don't have time today, but chapter 9, verses like 34, 35, somewhere like that, you're going to see that all 12 of the disciples got together and they were having a discussion once again about who's going to be prominent, who's going to be first. And Jesus gives them a lecture about, hey, the first will be last and last will be first. And you'd think they would have gotten it then, but not too far down the road. Here we are again. And these two guys have had this little scheme and they're really talking about this whole like, hey, and you know what the challenge is? I think the challenge that we see presented here is the fact that we all want to be number one. Have you ever watched a sporting event or any kind of event where somebody was like, hey, I'm number two, or better yet, hey, I'm three, three, three and a half. You know, nobody does that. They don't make foam fingers with, hey, I'm number four on them, right? There's no industry for that, right? You guys with me? It's always I'm number, because that's what we want. See, once again, the issue in our lives is we don't want to serve, we want to be in charge, and being in charge means I've got to be the leader. And yet, we all get together, and if I said, hey, who likes to be, which is easier to be a leader? I asked this this morning in our Sunday school class, which is easier, being a leader or a follower? Everybody's like, oh, being, I'd rather be a follower. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You'd much rather be a leader. You don't want anybody telling you what to do. You've quit jobs over that. You've broken up from relationships over that. You've rebelled against your parents over things like that. That's the truth. And for some of us, maybe some of you that really aren't hooked into this sermon because you're not a Christ follower, you've rejected Jesus because of that. Because the call to being a servant is a challenge. Because, you know what? It's been put in our minds and our hearts that we are need to walk out under the umbrella of Jesus' protection, that God. That happened way back in Genesis chapter 3. We don't want to have to follow. We want to lead our own way. And being a servant doesn't come easy because there's a battle with our own flesh. Because I want to, and, and, and hey, go, go to Romans. Romans chapter number uh, seven. The apostle Paul, he says, you know the things I, I know I'm supposed to do? I don't want to do those things. But the things I know I shouldn't be doing, those are the things I often find myself doing and I have this war that goes on within me. Why? Because I don't want to be a servant. I want to be in charge. I want to make the decision. And being a servant, this challenge of being a servant, it goes against our nature. See, John's request, James and John's their request here, it, it reveals the shallowness of their understanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus, doesn't it? It, it? it reveals the inflated opinion of their own importance, which often happens in churches, don't you think? It reveals the lack of understanding how God measures greatness. They didn't get that at all. Even though Jesus had already told them in chapter 8 and chapter 9, and here he is in chapter 10 trying to sum it up again. And here's the other thing I thought was so interesting. This is a side note here. At Jesus' most glorified time, when he's on the cross, on his left and on his right, weren't apostles and thrones. They were criminals on crosses. Jesus has an odd sense of humor, doesn't he? Because that was the place that was granted for those people, not James and John. James and John, you're going to have to suffer. And being appointed as a servant means we're appointed to God's purposes. See, James and John failed to see that the pathway to glory wasn't just to sit on a throne with Jesus. It was the pathway to suffering. The crown, and the, uh, the crown comes after the cup of suffering. Before the blessings that flow, there's a baptism that overwhelms, that drowns us. And that's what James and John didn't understand. So if we're going to be good servants of Jesus, before you go, hey, yeah, I'm, I'm all in to serve, you better understand the challenge that you present. The third aspect we see is we should consider the conflict. 
Consider the conflict, and this is where it gets interesting. Verse 41 says, when the 10, now, remember there's 12 disciples, 10 of them heard this. Jesus, I, I, I get this picture where they sort of got in this private conversation with Jesus, and Jesus stopped and turned around and got a little louder with them. And they were, I can see James and John's going, shh, 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 stop, 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 stop. Because they didn't want it heard. But the, the Bible says, when the 10 heard about this, that means all the other, in fact, I think the, probably the guy that led this whole indignant part was Peter, because Peter was always part of the inner three. James, John, and Peter are always together, and all of a sudden it's James and John, no Peter. But there's no, there's no Andrew, there's no Matthew, there's no Nathaniel, there's no, you go through all the rest of the guys, they're, they're not included in this. Just James and John, they wanted the prominence. We want to be over these guys. And it says, when they heard about this, they became indignant. And that word there carries that whole connotation of they weren't just angry, they were upset because they didn't do it first. That's what it's saying there. They were mad because, it, once again, go back to Mark chapter 9, you're going to find they were all fussing about who was going to be first, who was going to be most prominent. And now these two went ahead and launched a plan to get to Jesus first. In fact, in Matthew's account, Matthew says it's their mom that comes in, and they get mom involved, and that's even sadder. These two grown guys had to get mom involved, really? Really? But they became indignant with James and John. So you can see there's going to be some conflict here in being a servant. In verse 42, it says, Jesus called them together and said, You know, what do you know? And this is stuff we know. You know that those who are regarded as the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. What he's saying is, hey, you know what the unsaved world? They are all about power and position, aren't they? And the high officials exercise authority over them. He says, hey, remember Pilate and Herod? Caesar, all those guys, they aren't good guys. They're just powerful. And that's what we get the idea. We think, you know how important you feel like when you think about those guys. They have a self-importance. In verse 43, he says, not so with you. Don't be like this. And this is where he's teaching this great, great lesson. He says, instead, here it is, counterculture. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Diakonos, that's the Greek word there. Your servant. Same word we use for deacon in our church. That, that's what a deacon of the church is supposed to be, a servant. Serve people. Among you, it must be your servant. And he's saying, hey, you know what? You want to be the greatest amongst you? You, you just have to serve. And that word servant there is a table waiter. Someone that takes care of all the needs. That's the term servant. And he goes on, verse 44, and he says this, and whoever wants to be first, because that was what they were arguing about a chapter ago, whoever wants to be first place, number one, I'm the man, must be a, ooh, this is an offensive word, a slave, slave of all. Doulos, slave, that's the different word. And he's saying here, you know how a slave is? Slave has no rights, has no name, has no opinion, has no say. They're offensive in every aspect, but they're there just to meet the needs of whoever else. And he says, greatness, first place, is going to be the guy who does that. And this is where the conflict comes in. See, Jesus sees the building up of these men. They're all getting upset because they all want the same thing. And isn't that true of all? Hey, if it's true of those disciples, you know it's true of. If you're a Christ follower, you ought to be raising your hand right now. Because it's true of us. That's the truth. You know why churches fall apart and have fights and argue over pews and pulpits and colors of things and choirs and everything else? Because we all want to be first. We all want to be the greatest. We all have our opinions. And Jesus says, hey, you know what? You want to be great in my eyes, in God's eyes? The conflict is that you have to become a servant. You have to become a slave. See, he gives us two principles to think about, and it's a yes and no principle, or a no and yes principle, let's put it this way. What Jesus is saying here is you have to say no to the ways of the world. Remember, he said, hey, you know how the Gentile rules are. He's saying, say no to that. That's garbage. And it's, it's so hard because, you know what, you live in a world that you've been taught so many things. You've been infiltrated with American pride, right? Because American, the American way of doing things is to put yourself first and put everybody else down. And, and we, though America was founded on some godly principles, we in character have gone way away from those things now. And I'm just saying the truth. And we are actually counter, doing things counter the way God would say to do it in the world. 
It's true. Jesus says be a servant. And you know what the American dream is? To be the leader, to be self-important, to be own it all. You can have it all. Do it yourself. And that's not what God wants. He says you want to be great. There's a conflict. And so what you have to learn to do is say no to the ways of the world. No to the ways of getting ahead the way you think it should be. No to the means. Hey, you know what's crazy? Talk about, t- talk about financial matters. You know what? Jesus teaches so many countercultural things. Hey, do you want to be rich? Then you ought to give it all to God. That's what Jesus is teaching, right? And that's not what the world teaches. Keep it all. That's what the world would say. Save it all. Keep it all. Own it all. More, more, more. And Jesus says, no, less, less, less. It wasn't John the Baptist who understood this principle so well when he said, hey, you know what? He must increase while I must decrease. And that's the same principle he's given here. To be less. Say no to the ways of the world. In the world, you're more, the more important you are, the more people serve you. But in Jesus' world, the greater you are, the more people you serve. And that's what he gets to. But there's always the yes pr- principle, too. Because we're supposed to say no to the ways of the world, but we're supposed to say, and this is crazy, yes to the ways of the slave. What? Now, I know that term is so offensive, especially we've made it even more offensive in our day and age. Um, But what he's trying to get us to understand is our lack of self-importance should be primary in our serving God. That's the whole idea. See, he says, become a servant, become that, uh, the diakonos, the table waiter, become a household servant, become a slave, esteem others better than yourself, look out for their interest. Why? Because Jesus did it. Paul, over in Philippians chapter 2, as he's trying to help this church that was at war with themselves and war with everybody and conflict inside of it, he says, have the mind of Christ. So much so that Jesus Christ humbled himself. He's God Almighty. He humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant. He became a man, the weakest of all. He's God Almighty, has the power to do anything he wants. He's sovereign above all things, but he became flesh, born in a manger. We're going to celebrate at Christmas. And we celebrate it not because he was a great king on a throne. We celebrate it because he was a king that came down off his throne and became the humblest of all. He was born in a poor family and walked this earth for 33 years. He was crucified. But during that time period, everything he did was to serve other people, serve his father. And he didn't try to be number one. He lifted up people like Zach- uh, Zacchaeus. He lifted up Levi, Matthew. He made other people of primary importance. In fact, the only people he really got upset with were the religious people because they thought they were always important or most important. The last thing, fourth thing we should consider is being a servant, and this is so simple. He finishes out in verse 45, consider Christ. Consider Christ. That's so simple, isn't it? And then we've already read this verse, but you get the conclusion here because this is the greatest consideration of all. Verse 45, he says, for even. The term for ties us in with the argument of verses 33 and 34 grammatically. For. It tells us that what he's proposed in verse 33 and 34, to say no to the world's ways, to say yes to the way of the slave, this is it. And he says for, as a result of following this, this is what you can expect. He says for even. And I've already sort of emphasized, but the truth of the matter is he didn't have to. God, this is what's so strange about our, our understanding of who God is. He didn't have to do this. He would have been just as easy for God to wipe out all of humanity and say, you know what, I'll start over again. Did that once. Started over with Noah and his family, right? Could have easily done it again. They don't want me. They're rejecting me. It would have been easy, but he didn't. It says, for even the son of man, the title Daniel used, the prominent Old Testament title that introduced this deity as both human and divine. He didn't come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. (laughs) Considering Christ, Jesus told us that uh, his disciples that he would die in Jerusalem, and now he's telling them the why. Why? Why should I die? Why am I going to have to do this to give his life a ransom for many? Because God called me to serve. Why should you be a slave? Why should you be a servant? 
because that's what Jesus did. That's what he called us to. It's that simple. He called us, as Peter would say now, as he's matured in his letters, at the end of his life, he says, we're supposed to follow in his steps. You've been called to suffer. You've been called to serve. We're supposed to follow Christ in the service. We're supposed to call, follow Christ in the sacrifice. He says, uh, I love this, if you've never looked at this, the Son of Man did not come, but he did come, didn't he? See, at... at, at <laughs> In just a little while, in fact, uh, stores now are already putting out their Christmas decorations and everything. Some of the real fanatical people have already turned on Christmas music, which might be a little too early for that. But if you're really one of those Christmas crazies, you do that kind of stuff. Maybe you do it back in June or July. I like to wait a little bit. But that's not about celebrating presents and trees and decorations. It's about a servant who came and served and that's what Jesus introduces. He said, the Son of Man came. He came. He came. Why, why did he come? To give his life. And then he uses that term ransom. That ra term ransom speaks clearly of the substitutionary death that Jesus would die on the cross. You see, he didn't have to, but for our sakes, he wanted to. And his own righteousness demanded he dies, pays that price. But love provided the price, and that's what's great about it. Jesus calls you, calls me to follow him. And he calls us to walk where he walked, to serve as he served. You see, once again, and I start off with this, the most significant opportunities of your life lie in your ability not to do great things, not to have a name, not to define some kind of definition in your life, but your ability to serve cause of Christ. See, are we, are we sent, are we called to lead? Maybe. But are we called to serve? Absolutely. That's why Maple Springs is here. That's why Christians are here. We're here to be servants, not to make a name for ourselves, not to lay up for ourselves treasures here on earth, but to serve at the pleasure of our King. Let Today, if you've been watching and, and you were off the hook because you weren't a Christ follower, the invitation time that we, we always stress to you, everything that we've designed in today's service has been about our Father. We worship him because we love him, but we also worship him because he saved us. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, if you've never accepted him, I'm not talking did you pray a prayer because there's much more involved to that. That's, that's part of what we talked about today. But if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your Savior, we extend an invitation to you to get to know him. We'd love for the chance, the opportunity to take a Bible. Now, I, I'm just telling you, it's a Bible way, not a religious way. I, when I ask you if you've been saved, I'm not asking, are you a church member? I'm not asking you if you're Southern Baptist. I'm not asking you if you're, in fact, I'm not asking you if you're Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, whatever, because none of those things matter. I'm not asking, did you get baptized? I'm not asking, did you give to church? I'm not asking, have you attended Sunday school? I'm not asking any of those kind of things. Because once again, none of those things matter. What I'm asking is if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have a full relationship with him, if you don't even understand the question, let us show you from the Bible. Not what I think, but what the Bible says, what Jesus Christ said. That he loved you, he died on the cross for you, he was a servant to you. It's hard sometimes to admit that, but that's the truth. I remember as a kid growing up in the church, my dad was a pastor. Hey, you know what? There came a point in my life where I had to stop pretending that I was a Christian and actually go forward and say, you know what? I am just pretending I don't know Jesus Christ, my Savior. And so if you've never done that, it's very simple. But it is very certain. Because if you never come to that point in your life where you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, I need to warn you that ultimately it will cost you. See, not accepting Jesus Christ is the same as rejecting him. And for those who reject Jesus Christ, there's coming a judgment day where you'll spend all of eternity in the lake of fire burning. A lake that wasn't prepared for you, it was prepared for those demons, Satan himself, who rebelled against God. But Jesus gives you a choice and the choice is yours will you accept him will you reject him 
Most of the people in this crowd today have said that they accepted Jesus Christ. And for those here that, that are Christians, the invitation to you is, are you serving? Are you following? Or are you leading? How important do you put yourself? Are you trying to amass things here on this earth? Or are you being the servant, giving everything up because you realize you don't have any rights, you don't have any privileges, you're just a servant? There's conflict in serving. There's challenge to serving. There's a cost to serving. But we're called to serve because we walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And his example is that he gave everything for us. And the invitation today, Christians, what are you doing to serve your community? What are you doing to serve someone else? I know husbands that need to serve their wives better. Wives that need to serve their husbands better. Kids that need to serve their mom and dad better. Church members that need to get better involved in serving in their church. They're just sitting in pews. Uh Uh-oh. But we all need to do a better job of being witnesses, going out to the community, laying it out there on the line saying, you know what, I will follow Jesus no matter what, and I'm here to give the free gift that Jesus gave, some compassion, to be generous with my life and my time, my talents, my treasure. So what will you do today? The invitation's open. In just a moment, we'll, we'll sing a verse of invitation. You come and do what you need to do. God, we thank you for your son who served us, who didn't have to, who's so, so much far above us and so, so much greater than we are, that he came and humbled himself, took upon himself the form of a creature, a servant. He humbled himself. He died on the cross, took the wrath of God, drank that cup of the wrath of God, was baptized into the death, rose again for us. So we thank you for this, uh, this, this gift of your grace. So we pray today for those that are listening, those that might hear it online. I pray if there's someone here that doesn't know you, that has never accepted you as Savior, today would be the day that your Holy Spirit would impress upon them that today is the day of decision. Help them not to harden their hearts. God, I pray for the, the church members here, the Christians here. I pray that there be someone here that feels the call to serve you rather than serve themselves. We, we live in the, the most opulent society on, on this planet, and we've done so much more to enhance our families, our lives. God, we're not sent here, though, to build our own little kingdoms. We're here to build your kingdom. So, God, I pray you just help us today. In this invitation, press upon us the need to serve you and be a good servant of yours. To be great is to be less. So help us to decrease while you increase. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand. I surrender all. What a great song for today's message. Hey, I surrender all. Don't sing it if you don't really mean it, though. As we sing. so much for being here today. Uh, Thank you for being part of this sermon series that we're in. Uh, Kaleo, uh, this has been such a great uh, sermon series where we learned that we're called. We're called to care. Uh, We're called to generosity. And then today we're we're called to serve. Uh, Next week uh, we'll be uh, looking at uh, we're called to make disciples. I hope that you've enjoyed this sermon series, but more than just enjoy a sermon series, I hope that you've grabbed something out of the sermon series. And if there's any part that you've missed, 
hey, feel free to go to that website. You can, you can replay any of the sermons, and you can even go to some of the sermon series before now. Uh, use that. Uh, that's what it's there for, and not only for yourself, uh, but share that with others as well. Uh, as far as announcements, I do have uh, uh, several announcements. Uh, the first one, uh, kind of important because uh, Miss Sheila would say that you're, you're called to one more thing. Uh, you're called to bring some more Halloween candy in uh, because we need a lot more. Uh, uh, we need a lot more candy. Uh, and also, hey, the time is shrinking on the, the amount of time that we have before uh, this Halloween festival over at the Seagrove Elementary School. I'd ask uh, that, that you just be praying towards that. Uh, yes, absolutely. We need everybody to volunteer for this. Uh, there's a job for everybody, but our prayer should be for the community that's around, that that we have the opportunity to reach uh, folks that typically don't come to church. Uh, some of them will be other church members, uh, but a lot that comes through, they're not affiliated with any church. And this is a great reach. Uh, this is a great outreach uh, that we can use in our own community. Uh, so I'd ask that you to be praying towards that. Also, uh, we have flyers uh, back there in the back. You can grab those flyers as you leave. Uh, that way you have something to put into somebody's hand. And also there's some posters back there as well. Uh, if you know of somewhere that we can hang a poster uh, and they wouldn't mind, hey, grab one of them and hang it up for us. Uh, we'd appreciate that. Also, the, one of the best ways of communicating this, uh, when you see the poster come up on Facebook or any other uh, social media platform, share it. Uh, pass it along uh, so we can get, get the word out to as many people as we can. I mean, that's... that's uh, that's easy work there. Uh, I ask that you just do that when you see those uh, pop up uh, on your uh, social media. Uh, also, don't forget, uh, October 22nd, uh, it will be a pastor's appreciation luncheon here uh, right after service. Uh, I'd ask that you come out and uh, show your appreciation to our pastor uh, uh, for all the work that he does and even all the behind the scenes that you don't nearly see that he does behind the scenes. Uh, uh, and just show your appreciation to him. Yes. Well, I wasn't going to mention that, uh, uh, but but come out for that. Uh, uh, remember, that's the 22nd. Uh, uh, come out for that right after service that day. Also, uh, next week, uh, next week uh, we're going to be doing a Christmas uh, play this year, and next week we're having our interest. Uh, luncheon uh, right after service next week for anybody that's interested in the Christmas play this year we'd ask that you come out next Sunday uh, and plan to stay for lunch and everything afterwards and we're going to talk about it look at it and, and, and if you have any questions that would be time to ask as well but if you have any questions before then hey please see uh, uh, Miss Angie or Miss Sandra as far as that goes uh, finance committee meeting that's Scheduled for today at 4.30. It's no longer scheduled for today at 4.30. Uh, there are several that couldn't be there. So finance committee next Sunday, same time, 4.30, uh, back in the classroom uh, next week. Again, not today, but next week. Uh, also, uh, men's Bible study. Uh, guys, y'all start, start back up tomorrow. And also, Ladies for Christ, uh, they will be at Miss Holly's this Wednesday. If you have any questions about those, feel free to reach out to Bob. I know he's not here today, uh, but you can always uh, uh, send him a text or a phone call if you have questions about that. Of course, if you have any questions about the ladies' ministry, uh, Miss Sandra is here. Uh, please see her uh, before you leave out today. Uh, as far as our prayer request, uh, don't forget, if you don't have one yet, make sure you grab a prayer guide before you leave today. Uh, that's a great tool for you to be able to record uh, your prayer requests, your praise reports, and you can write those down. Now, if you have some that you want to get to us, please go to the website, leave them there. You can go to the Facebook family page. Uh, but, of course, like I've always said, if you're not that IT guy, if you're not technology in any way, hey, write it on a piece of paper, drop it in an offering bucket as you leave out today, and we'll get it put in there for you. Uh, but please make sure you use your prayer guide. Also, that prayer guide has a calendar in it. Uh, that's your way you can keep up with all these dates that I've been throwing at you. Uh, and also, it has the website on there as well, uh, so you have ease of access there. Uh, use that. That's what it's there for. It's a tool uh, for you. As we do each and every week, uh, we end with our offerings and our tithes. Uh, like I've said before, this is not an add-on by no means. This is our continued worship of God. Uh, you know, we've talked about be. Uh, being called uh, to care, being called to serve, being called to generosity. 
Hey, we're also we're, we're called that that generosity part uh, and the serving part and the caring part for our communities. You know, the best way that we can do that is actually through our giving because everything that we give goes to our ministry, not just here at Maple Springs, but also our ministry around the community. I mean, that's where all the funds for the Halloween Festival is coming from. Uh, from our giving and our worship of God in that way. So with that said, let's end in a word of prayer. Don't forget we'll have service tonight. Adults in here, youth down in the fellowship hall. With that said, let's end in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for each and every day that you give us. Father, you are so gracious and so loving. And Father, uh, I hope that we never take that for granted, Father. But today you've, you've called us to be here together today to worship you as family. Father, we thank you for that. And Father, I, I pray that, that you just lead us and guide us as we, as we live out these words uh, that Brother Bill has put in front of us, Father. Uh, because we are called. Father, we are called to, uh, to care. Father, we're called to generosity. We're called to serve, Father. Father, you've called us to do these things. That's what we are supposed to do, Father. Lead us and guide us in that, Father. Father, I ask that the offering that we are taking up now, Father, goes to your kingdom and your kingdom alone, Father. Uh, not so that other people could see us drop money in or, or put money in, Father. But, Father, that, that you know we are continuing to worship you as we give, Father. Lead us and guide us in that. Now, Father, lead us and guide us again, Father, as we leave out these doors, as we go about our business this week, Father, up and down the roads, Father, in and out of different areas, Father. I ask that you just lead and guide our steps, Father. Leading God our, our actions with our hands, Father. But most of all, lead our words, Father. Father, may the world around us see that we are different because of what you've done for us. Lead us and God us in that. And again, Father, we thank you and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.